خلافتنا بنا سور فتية عظيم شأنها بين البرية السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our next program in our brand new series, Beacon of Guidance. Beacon of Guidance is a weekly program which will be a compilation of questions and answers given by our beloved Hazur, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, from the virtual mulaqats, classes and compiled letters from Ahmadis from all over the world. Let's now turn to the Gambia for our first question. On Saturday, the 29th of May, 2021, Beloved Hazur blessed Majlis Khudam al Ahmadiyya Gambia with a virtual mulaqat, during which a Khadim asked Hazur, what can Africa do to be self-sufficient and achieve development? Assalamu alaikum, Beloved Hazur. My question is, uh, what can Africa do to be self-sufficient and achieve development? It is not only a matter of uh, achieving some target of Africans only. Every nation who works hard will develop and achieve their targets. So the first thing is that uh, you should give more emphasis on education. You see, your literacy rate should be very high. Not that every student gets primary education, but the target of the African government should be that every person of their country, whether it's a girl or boy, man or woman, should be highly educated. The minimum requirement should be secondary education. And if it is graduation, then that will be much better. See, if you are educated and your liter literacy rate is high, then it will broaden your mind. Then you will try to see what the world is doing and the world, where the world is going and what should be our goals and targets and objectives. So you fix your targets, big targets, so that when you fix your big targets, you will work hard to achieve them. And be honest and sincere with your work, as I've already said. See, if you are a teacher, you should fully concentrate on teaching your student with full preparation. Not that you, you are not well prepared and go to the school and start teaching the students. If you are a worker, you should work hard as much as you can. If you are a bureaucrat, you should be very sincere and honest with your work and try hard to achieve the ultimate object of the, your assignment or complete your assignment within the prescribed time and as early as possible. So work hard, be honest and sincere to your work and to your nation. And that will help you to develop and, uh, and the basic thing as I have told you is the education. Every person should try hard to get better education, right? So if you are a well-educated person, then your goals will also be high, right? And use that knowledge and wisdom which you, you get for the betterment of your nation, for the service of your nation. For our second question, beloved Hazur had graced a virtual mulaqat in Urdu with Ahmadi Muslims from the West Bank on the 18th of June, 2021. They asked beloved Hazur whether it is acceptable for an Ahmadi to hide their faith due to the risk of opposition. Let's hear what Hazur said. بات یہ ہے کہ اگر خوف ہے اور مقابلہ نہیں کر سکتا خاص طور پہ عورتیں مقابلہ نہیں کر سکتی تو دل میں ان کے ایمان ہے تو اس کو رکھیں اور نہ ظاہر کریں لیکن اس میں کوئی حرج نہیں ہے لیکن اگر 
مقابلہ کرنے کی ہمت ہے ضرورت ہے مرد ہے تو پھر ظاہر کرنا چاہیے اب صحابہ کی جو تاریخ ملتی ہے ہمیں اس میں یہی ہے کہ بعض صحابہ شروع میں جو ایمان لائے انہوں نے ان کو کہیں کسی دوسرے بڑے رئیس کی اور سردار کی پناہ مل گئی تو ان پہ ظلم نہیں ہوتے تھے انہوں نے کہا اب ہم اپنا آپ کا پناہ واپس کرتے ہیں اور ہم اسی طرح ان ظلموں کو برداشت کرنا چاہتے ہیں جس طرح ہمارے باقی بھائی برداشت کر رہے ہیں لیکن ساتھ ہی یہ بھی طریق سے ثابت ہے کہ آن حضرت صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے بعض لوگوں کو کہا کہ ٹھیک ہے اگر تم لوگ مقابلہ نہیں کر سکتے اپنے ایمان کو چھپا کے رکھو اور دل میں رکھو نہ ظاہر کرو حکمت کا تقاضا بھی یہی ہے بہت سارے مسلمان تھے جو ہجرت آن حضرت صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کی ہجرت کے بعد بھی مکے میں رہے اور وہ ایمان لے آئے ہوئے تھے اور انہوں نے ایمان چھپایا ہوا تھا بعض ایسے واقعات ملتے ہیں کہ بعض جو کفار کے لشکر آتے تھے جنگوں کے لیے آئے ان میں وہ شامل ہو کے آ گئے اور جب آ گئے دو آدمیوں کو ذکر ملتا ہے پچھلے جب میں نے خود بات صحابہ کا ذکر کر رہا ہوں اس میں بھی ذکر کیا تھا کہ ایک جنگ میں اسی طرح لشکر آیا اس کے ساتھ دو اشخاص جنہوں نے اپنا ایمان چھپایا ہوا تھا وہ شامل ہو کے آ گئے اور جب وہ قریب پہنچ گئے اسلامی لشکر کے تو ان سے کفار کے لشکر کو چھوڑ کے اسلامی لشکر میں آ کے شامل ہو گئے اور بتایا کہ ہم بہانہ بنایا تھا ہم نے نکلنے کا اس طرح ہم ان کے ساتھ شامل ہو کے آ گئے ہیں تو انہوں نے اتنا عرصہ اپنا ایمان چھپا کے رکھا آن حضرت صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے ان کو یہ نہیں کہا کہ کیوں چھپا کے رکھا بلکہ ان کو پناہ دی اور اس مسلمانوں میں شامل کر لیا تو یہ تاریخ میں ملتے ہیں واقعات جو میں آج کا صحابہ کے واقعات بیان کر رہا ہوں اس میں بھی اس کا ذکر ہو چکا ہے چند مہینے پہلے ہی میں نے ایک خطبے میں اس کا ذکر کیا تھا تو اس میں کوئی حیرت نہیں اور خاص طور پہ عورتیں جو ہیں وہ اگر سمجھتی ہیں کہ ان کا ایمان ظاہر ہونے سے ان کے ساتھ تنگیاں وارد ہوں گی اور وہ برداشت نہیں کر سکیں گی تو ان کو چھپا کے رکھنا چاہیے کوئی حرج نہیں ہے اس میں لیکن جب موقع ملے پھر اس کا اظہار بھی ہو جانا چاہیے فار تھرڈ کوشچن وی ول ٹرن ٹو دا یو کے آن دا فرسٹ آف مئی ٹو تھاؤزینڈ اینڈ ٹوئنٹی ون مجلس فال الحمدیہ نارتھن ریجن و بلیسڈ ود اے ورچوئل ملاقات ود بلاوڈ حضور اطفل ہیڈ آسٹ حضور دا فالوئنگ کوشچن In the Quran, chapter 6, verse 160, And for those who split up their religion and become divided into sects, thou hast no concern at all with them. Surely their case will come before Allah. Then will he inform on what they used to do. Which means that sects are forbidden. Why is Ahmadiyya a sect? Let's take a look at Hazu's response. You see... It was the prophecy of the Holy Prophet وسلم, that uh, in the later days my Ummah will be divided into 72 sects. Okay? And each sect will think that uh, they are on the right path. They will have different point of views and uh, Each sect will think that their point of view is the best. And they are following the true teaching of the Quran. And they are following the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi See, in the present Muslim sects, there are some sects who are following Holy Quran. They do not, do not believe in Hadith. Some, they are following Hadith. And they give more preference to Hadith. and some other people have some different point of views. So this prophecy has been fulfilled. And now, the Holy Prophet also said, when this will happen, then at that time, a reformer will come. Who will follow my true teachings? who will guide you and he will be called Messiah and Mahdi, the rightly, gu- rightly guided person. This is why we believe that that person whose advent was foretold by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu has come in the person of 
was Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadiyan. He said that Allah Ta'ala has appointed me as the Messiah and Mahdi of this age according to the prophecy of the Holy Prophet And now he has made it clear to me what are the right teachings. So I am also the person who will decide what is wrong and what is right. Lakam and other make the decision according to the teaching of the Holy Quran and the Sunnah. This is why the Prophet Muhammad says that we have to give preference first to the Holy Quran, where all the teachings about the religions are given. Then we have to follow the Sunnah, what the Holy Prophet practiced, and then we should see the Ahadith, which were collected almost 150 years later. And then see that how many of them are correct and are supporting the verses of the Holy Quran. Or the Holy Quran supports whatever they are saying. So the Prophet Messiah is the rightly guided person who started this community according to the prophecy of the Holy Prophet and according to the prophecy of Allah Ta'ala Himself. Because in Surah Juma, Allah Ta'ala says that the community will uh, be established on the footsteps of the same community which the Holy Prophet has established. Right? So our sect is the that sect whose Commencement was prophesied by the Holy Prophet himself and the Holy Quran itself. And he, the person who was to come in the later days was to bring all the different Muslim sects on one hand. This is why he is called Mahdi. So here the situation is different. All those sects which were established or developed, they were following different school of thoughts according to the teaching of Quran and Hadith and this and that. But here the Ahmadiyya sect was established according to the prophecy of the Holy Quran and the Holy Prophet This is why we cannot say that uh, Jamaat Ahmadiyya is the same sect as the other sects in Islam. They were the sects which were developed because of the deviation in their school of thoughts. The Prophet Messiah who was to come has come to bring them together so that it, he forms a one sect and that is Jamaat Ahmadiyya and that is according to the prophecy of the Holy Prophet Let's now go to the Ahmadiyya Jamaat in Nigeria. On the 1st of October 2021, Beloved Hazur blessed a virtual mulakat in Urdu with Lajna Imaila, Nigeria, where they had asked regarding whether there is any conflict between religion and modern day civilization. Let's hear the insight that Hazur has given on this. Actually, those people who say that religion keeping you away from civilization, they are wrong and we are right. It is the religion which has brought the civilization in the world. Even these people, they accept that had there not been any prophet, there would not have been any civilization in the world. At one side, they claim that religion brought the civilization and on the other side say that no, you should not practice religion because it is taking you away from the modern day civilization. Modern day civilization is just nothing but immorality. And freedom of everything which is uh, not giving you something good, but rather spoiling your life. So do not fear these people. You are the civilized people 
who follow the religion and who follow these teachings of the Holy Quran. Even as being Muslim, you should follow the teaching of the Holy Quran and find out what are the commandments given to you in the Holy Quran which you have to do, right? So, you are actually the civilized people, not those people who are atheist or not believing in any religion. There is no need to indulge yourself in any complex. For the fifth question, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih the fifth, Ayyadul Hatala bin Aziz, blessed a virtual mulakat with Lajna Imaila from Sweden on the 26th of November, 2021. One of the members had asked, what is the Islamic perspective on the theory of evolution? My theory of evolution is the جنگلوں میں رہنے والا تھا پھر ایسا ایسا اس کو عقل آتی رہی ڈیولپمنٹ ہوتی رہی لیکن بندر جو تھا وہ بندر کی نسل چلی اسے جو انسان تھا اس کی سے انسان کی نسل ہی چلی ہیں تو ایولیوشن کو تو ہم مانتے ہیں کہ ہوا قرآن کریم میں بھی ہے لکھا ہوا ایولیوشن ہے اور یہ انسان جو ہے اس حالت میں پہنچا اور ابھی تک ایولیوشن ہو رہا ہے اس لیے ہم تو یہ نہیں کہتے کہ ایولیوشن نہیں ہوا انسان کا ایولیوشن ہوا اور اس سٹیج پر پہنچا ابھی بھی مختلف حالتیں پیدا ہوتی جا رہی ہیں لیکن جو بندر تھے وہ بندر تھے جو بیٹل تھے وہ بیٹل تھے جو جانور تھے وہ جانور تھے یہ ہم نہیں مانتے کہ ڈارون کی تھیوری صحیح ہے لیکن یہ ہم مانتے ہیں کہ ایولیوشن ضرور ہوا لیٹس موو ٹو دا سیکنڈ پارٹ آف دا پروگرام ان دس سیگمنٹ وی ول بی ٹیکنگ اے لک ایٹ کویشچنز اینڈ آنسرز وچ ہیو بین کمپائلڈ ان الحکم کولڈ آنسرز ٹو ایوری ڈے ایشوز which Hazrat the Mirul Mu'mineen, Khalifatul Masih V, Ayyudullah Ta'ala bin Nasr al-Aziz, has given on various occasions in his written correspondence and during MTA programs. For our first letter, Hazrat the Mirul Mu'mineen, Khalifatul Masih V, was asked about a statement he had made during one of his Friday sermons regarding the special time for the acceptance of prayer that comes on Fridays. In a letter dated the 4th of February 2020, Hazur Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asla Aziz replied, In my Friday sermon, I stated in light of the ahadith and the instructions of Hazrat Musleh Ma'ud anhu about the special hour of acceptance of prayers on Fridays, that it is a very short period of time. Moreover, different times of the day have been ascribed to it. Hadith scholars and jurists have also stated different times between zenith and sunset, during which this moment can occur. In my view, the wisdom behind ascribing different times to this hour is that the entire day of Friday is full of blessings. Hence, one should spend this whole day supplicating. Hazur Ayyadahullah was also asked about another statement he made during the concluding address of Jalsa Salana UK with regard to reciting the shorter surahs of the Holy Quran during the Taraweeh prayer instead of a whole part. As far as the shortening of prayers is concerned, you have confused two of my statements in this regard. I said, with reference to a hadith, that someone complained to the Holy Prophet wasallam about an imam who used to greatly prolong the prayers. The Holy Prophet wasallam expressed his displeasure over this. Then, I said that shortening the prayers does not mean that prayer should be offered mindlessly in a hurry. In this regard, I gave the example of a clip of Taraweeh prayers circulating on social media, in which the Imam concluded all the rak'at of the Taraweeh prayer within minutes. So, my point was that prayers should neither be prolonged to such an extent that the worshippers get tired and start to resent them, nor is it permissible to shorten a prayer so much that it merely looks like sudden movements instead of a prayer. Moreover, it should also be remembered that the prayers which the Holy Prophet ﷺ has instructed to be kept brief are the obligatory farz prayers. The reason for this is that the obligatory prayers must be performed in congregation by all. 
The Holy Prophet وسلم, said that since the worshippers could include the sick, old, weak, and those who needed to go to work, it was the responsibility of the Imam to take all of them into consideration and conclude the prayer within a reasonable time. However, Taraweeh is a supererogatory prayer and it is not obligatory upon everyone to perform it. Rather, those who can easily participate in it should do so and those who have an excuse are free not to. There is nothing wrong with that. Moreover, Taraweeh prayers began during the Khilafat of Hazrat Umar anhu, and he initiated them especially for the recitation of the Holy Qur'an. Therefore, there should be relatively longer recitation in them and if possible, the entire Holy Qur'an should be completed during the Taraweeh prayers in the blessed month of Ramadan. For the second letter, a lady informed Hazrat the Middle Mu'mineen Khalifa al-Masih V of the demise of her brother and asked about Islamic injunctions regarding the mourning by a widow and the mourning by other people, especially the mourning of a sister over the death of a brother. Hazur Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asr Aziz in a letter dated the 4th of February 2020 had shed some light on the matter. Islam has guided its followers regarding every matter of happiness as well as sorrow. Hence, where on the one hand, it exhorts to be patient after the death of a loved one, on the other, it also allows the bereaved to express grief caused by separation. All the loved ones, including parents, siblings and children of the deceased, are allowed to mourn for a maximum of three days. A wife, on the other hand, has been instructed to mourn the death of her husband for a period of four months and ten days. This is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah of the Holy Qur'an. Moreover, the instructions of the Holy Prophet وسلم, in this regard that he gave at various occasions are also recorded in a hadith. Hence, it is narrated by Hazrat Zainab anha bint Abi Salama who was the stepdaughter of the Holy Prophet وسلم, I went to Hazrat Umm Habiba anha, the noble wife of the Holy Prophet وسلم, who said that she heard Allah's Messenger وسلم, saying, It is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and the last day to mourn for any dead person for more than three days, except for her husband, for whom she should mourn for four months and ten days. The narrator further states, Later I went to Hazrat Zainab bin Jash when her brother died. When three days had passed after the demise of her brother, she asked for some scent, and after applying it on herself, she said, I am not in need of scent, but I heard Allah's Messenger وسلم, while on the pulpit saying, It is not permissible for a woman who believes in Allah and the last day to mourn for more than three days for any dead person except her husband, for whom she should mourn for four months and ten days. Thus, all the bereaved, save the widow, whether they are parents, children or siblings, are allowed to mourn for only three days, not more than that. As far as the limits and the scope of mourning by a widow is concerned, which is four months and ten days, Islam does not make any exceptions to this, nor does it grant any age-related exemption. Therefore, it is incumbent upon a widow to spend this period of idda in her home as much as possible. She is not allowed to adorn herself, participate in social events or leave the house unnecessarily during that period. During the Hidda period, a widow may go to her husband's grave to pray, provided that the grave is in the town where the widow resides. Moreover, if she has to go to the doctor, she would be exempt on the grounds of compelling circumstances. Similarly, if a widow's family's livelihood depends on her job, or she has no other arrangements for taking the children to school, and bringing them back or doing the shopping, then all these circumstances would grant her an exemption on grounds of compelling circumstances. In such a case, it would be incumbent upon her to go straight to work and return home after completing the work. That is the maximum extent of the permission to leave the house on grounds of compelling circumstances or dire need. She is not allowed to participate in any kind of social gatherings or programs. For our third and final letter, Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mini, Khalifatul Masih V, in a letter dated the 4th of February 
2020 stated the following regarding an edict issued by the Nazim of Darul Ifta on the issue of unaccompanied women going on a journey to perform Hajj. Hazur Ayyudullah Ta'ala bin Asl Aziz said the following. In my view, the condition of having a male mahram with a woman for Hajj and Umrah was based on a temporary ruling, just as other travel was forbidden for an unaccompanied woman at the time, because in those days, journeys used to be very difficult and lengthy. Facilities were not available on the way, and on top of that, the risks of being robbed were very high. Hence, when a complaint of a robbery was once brought before the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he gave the glad tiding of peaceful journeys in the future and said to Hazrat Adi bin Hatim فَإِن طَالَتْ بِكَ حَيَاتٌ لَتَرَيَنَّ الضَّغِينَ تَتَرْتَحِلُ مِنَ الْحِيرَةِ حَتَّى تَطُوفَ بِالْكَعْبَةِ لَا تَخَافُ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ If you live for a long time, you will certainly see that a lady in a hoda traveling from Al-Hira will safely reach Mecca and perform the tawaf, circumambulation of the Kaaba, fearing none but Allah. At the end of the same hadith, Hazrat Adi bin Hatim radiallahu anhu narrates, فَرَأَيْتُ الضَّغِينَ تَتَرْتَحِلُ مِنَ الْحِيرَةِ حَتَّى تَطُوفَ بِالْكَعْبَةِ لَا تَخَافُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Later on, I saw a lady in a hawda traveling from Al-Hira till she arrived safely in Mecca and performed the tawaf of the Kaaba, fearing none but Allah. Al-Hira was a town in the Persian Empire at that time and was located near Kufa, which means that it would have been a journey lasting several days at that time. So, in those days, if a woman could embark on a journey from Al-Hira and travel for several days and come to perform the tawaf of the Kaaba in Mecca, then why can't a woman travel for a few hours by plane these days and go for Umrah and Hajj, etc.? That concludes this episode of Beacon of Guidance. Join us again soon to hear more guidance from our beloved Hazur. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.